there are some really interesting derbies going on, but I mean, at the top of the list for me, we got to start at number one, right? It's Ohio State. It's Ohio State because Ohio State has built its reputation to the opposite, frankly, of one Georgia, which say the offense is what moves the needle. And that's also, you know, been true of most national championship programs, right? Including Ohio State in the college football era. Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence. You know, we keep going down the line here. Tua Tonga Valoa. These are guys that are not only great in our sport, but become the next great group of quarterbacks at the next level. So the guy that wins between Kyle McCord and Devin Brown feels like the dude that's going to inherit a machine that is capable of getting back to the college football playoff. Now, they will have to deal with not having beaten Michigan in two years. One of the reasons that Justin Fields gets to walk around being Justin Fields in Columbus, he's undefeated against Michigan. C.J. Stroud, not so much. Kyle McCord might get a couple opportunities. Devin Brown might get a couple opportunities. But whomever it is, that guy's got to hit the ground running, and he's going to do it with the best wide receiver in the sport in Marvin Harrison Jr. But as much as I've talked about Kyle McCord, and that's who I still believe will win the job because of his relationship with Marvin Harrison Jr., because he's the only guy that started a game at Ohio State as a quarterback, right? And because he's been in the system just that much longer than Devin Brown. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that Devin Brown can't sling it. And there's a reason why he's quarterback at Ohio State. And there's a reason why he's staying in the fight for the job, right? I think this is really interesting and telling about Devin Brown because I could tell you about him throwing for 4,800 yards, 57 TDs at Corner Canyon as a transfer and new offense as a senior. That would be enough, right? We would all get on board with that. Dude could sling it. But what I love is my man changed his number from 15 to 33 during the spring. Now, I will be very interested to see if he wears 33 come the fall because that's not usually a quarterback jersey. Unless you're a historian like Devin Brown, for which you know, Sammy Baugh wore 33. And the quote from Devin Brown is, number 33 is the original quarterback number. And Ryan Day is all about it. Brian Hartline is all about it. And you know what? So am I. You want to sit wear single digits as a defensive lineman? You want to stretch that zero, zero all the way out? Please do it. Now we got to give that 33 back to the quarterback. You see, if the quarterback's wearing 33, that's got to change the mentality of your football team and the one that's a lot more physical. As a matter of fact, the dude on the other side of the ball that wears 33, Jack Sawyer. A blessed guy, Ohio defensive end that ought to be coming into his own in 2023. Very excited to see which one of those guys, Kyle McCord or Devin Brown, can win that derby. Number two on the list for me, Alabama. All right. Now, it's interesting because we haven't seen an open quarterback competition at Alabama go into the summer since like Jalen Hurts' true freshman year in 2016. So it's been some time, but that's not exactly how Nick Saban wants to do this. He likes having the quarterback settled by the spring. It was very clear that come 2021, Everybody knew Bryce Young was going to be the guy at the end of the spring. There was no derby whatsoever. Now you've got what I think are three guys competing for the job. It's not that Eli Holstein or Dylan Longerin aren't talented enough. It's that I think they want the older guys to assert some control here, right? So you've got Jalen Milrow and Ty Simpson who are allowed to mostly duke it out in the spring. But either you don't feel like you have a guy or you feel like you need to make the room better because both Tommy Reese and Nick Saban went to go get Tyler Buckner out of the portal and bring him to Tuscaloosa, right? Talk a little bit about how Tyler Buckner got to Tuscaloosa in a minute. But that it feels like a very even competition because Tyler Buckner and Jalen Milrow provide you the same set of skills. Both are lethal in the open field. Both have their issues throwing the ball to teams that don't wear their jersey, okay? Both have issues putting the ball on the floor. And at least one of them has proven that he cannot get himself out of harm's way enough to stay healthy on the field, right? That'd be Buckner, right? But I think that Ty Simpson also could sneak into this because he's much more of a polished passer. And if that's what Tommy Reese is looking for, a dude that can hit on those deep vertical play action passes, maybe he's the guy, also the son of a coach and a national, excuse me, not national, Tennessee Gatorade player of the year coming out of high school. So I think they got good options there. I'm just interested. I think it's going to be Milrow because again, like McCord, he started a game last year. The difference is he started a game against five and seven Texas A&M. They damn near lost and put the ball on the floor, threw it to the other team. Those are those are two things that Nick Saban just does not abide. I say that, but, you know, everybody wants to tell me how great Jalen Hurts is and all that dude was put the ball on the floor in pivotal games, you know, like the Super Bowl. I know he played well, guys. 
He also put the ball on the floor, and that's the difference in the game. Get off of James Bradbury, get back on your quarterback that you're paying all this money. Okay? I'm saying this as an Oklahoma guy because I also remember 63 28. But before I get all the way over there, if you can get Jalen Hurts style numbers out of any one of these dudes, you're going to be golden. You're going to be fine, right? I think you're going to be in a really good spot. Okay, number three on the list Georgia. All right. Now, everybody that I trust over in Athens will tell me straight up and down, Carson Beck will start the season as the starting quarterback at the University of Georgia. Why didn't Kirby Smart just come out and say that then? Because everybody's sure, except perhaps Kirby Smart, right? Now, you watch the spring game, you could see that Carson Beck had command of the offense. He knew what was coming. He was in sync with Mike Bobo. And you could understand how the guy that doesn't turn the ball over, the guy that manages the offense, is the guy that Kirby Smart wants to be starting. Plus, he's a fourth-year quarterback, and that's a lot for Kirby. He likes to let the guy that's way out in front in as far as uh, being into the system be the guy. Not unlike Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I also think it's interesting that both Beck and third-year quarterback Brock Vandergriff split reps in the spring. So Vandergriff, the only five-star of that group, that includes Gunnar Stockton, getting as many reps as Carson Beck means, hey, we're going to give the dude for Prince Avenue Christian every opportunity to beat out Carson Beck, especially because he's a third-year guy. And there are also some really interesting notes to add about Vandergriff, who I got to know as he was being recruited to Oklahoma, ends up committing to Oklahoma, decommitting from Oklahoma, ends up at Georgia. So he grew up an Auburn fan in Georgia, which I find fascinating. And he had not been to a game at Sanford until he was recruited. And that was when it flipped for him. He wanted to be a Georgia Bulldog then which is another reason why we invest so much time and energy into talking about recruiting because it really does matter. You grew up an Auburn fan and ended up with Georgia, knowing that if he'd have gone to Auburn, he probably would have been starting two years ago, but it'd also be Auburn. He wouldn't have two national championship ranks, right? I also think it's interesting that he shares living space, you know, rooms with Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers is the best tight end in the country. Some would say the best pass catcher in the country. Knowing that you eat and breathe with that dude, i like to see what Brock Bowers thinks about who should be the starting quarterback because that chemistry really does matter. You see that a, a theme of this show and a theme that I really much, very much believe in is the more time that a quarterback and a wide receiver or pass catcher spend together, the better that duo is, right? Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase over at LSU becomes a Super Bowl uh, participant, excuse me, at the Bengals, right? Marvin Harrison, Kyle McCord won three state titles at Philadelphia at St. Joe's before they got to Ohio State, right? I'm looking at Brock Bowers, looking at Brock Vandegrift, and I'm going, ooh, two Brocks that live together. One dude who is unstoppable as a tight end, and the other guy that's got five-star skills. Maybe you want to see what they can do together. I also think it's really interesting that Brock Vandegrift will graduate from Georgia in three years, right? Which means that at the end of this year, he can be a grad transfer. And if they still ain't got their dude over at Alabama, I would be shocked to find out that we don't hear more about tampering, right? And I say that knowing that the story about Kirby Smart leaving the job at Alabama to go to Georgia is one that Alabama fans still hold on. I don't know if there's any truth to it, but the rumor was large enough, so I'm not going to repeat it. All to say, everybody is trying to win, right? And I also thought this quote from Vandegrift about how Coach Smart is picking the quarterback. He said Coach Smart and not Coach Bobo, hello, right, is telling. So the quote that he gave to dognation.com is, Coach Smart, he's going to put the best guy out there. He's going to give the best guy that gives Georgia the best chance to win. He's going to be out there. It's just being in this competition is being a blessing. He's saying all the right things, what I'm saying, right? He's saying all the right things. He's doing all the right things. And quiet as it is kept, his father, Greg Vandegrift, is an outstanding high school football coach over at Prince Avenue. Got to know him a little bit and one of the things that he very much loved about high school football in Georgia is they basically play it seven months a year, right? Like they can start playing preseason football in July. It's one of the reasons that Georgia football is so good and why everybody goes there to get players. And his dad is a defensive-minded coach, which is another way of saying Brock knows how to read defenses, right? So he's not coming in there as an also ran. I think if something happens, you want to have both Carson Beck and Brock Vandegrift ready to go, and that is a thing that we're seeing throughout college football, which leads me to number four on the list, Ole Miss. I think the guy's Jackson Dart. I think the guy's Jackson Dart because after the spring game, Lane Kiffin, in his opening statement, which means unprompted, 
had this to say. We obviously kind of moved the scoreboard there at the end just to have some fun, to make it a one-score game instead of a two-score game. And that was good to see Jackson and his team respond to that and go down and score. Okay, I've given you the setup. I've also given you the punch of name-checking the starting quarterback from last year. Now, later on in responding to questions about evaluating this loaded quarterback room that includes not just Jackson Dart, but Walker Howard and Spencer Sanders, who's grad transferring from Oklahoma State, he said, so the idea was an offseason to improve that room, make it competitive, bring guys in. It's not just competitive like everybody else thinks for the first spot. It's just to make the room better. Okay. I made the analogy yesterday when people say, well, why do you add these guys when you only have one quarterback play at a time? I say, okay, well, do you like having really good pitchers on a baseball team? You like to have more than one. I wouldn't use a pitching staff to refer to my quarterback room, but his point is taken, right? Something happens in far as injuries. Something happens in, in as far as one guy's in sync in preseason, another guy is not. You want to have a talented quarterback room. Everybody does. And with the transfer portal, you can go pick and choose the guys you want to have in your room. I think that that is going to make Jackson Dart a better quarterback, but I believe he will start the season as a starting quarterback. And if he should fall off, then maybe we'll see Walker Howard or even Spencer Sanders. But knowing that you've got a really good group of quarterbacks in that room also means that your practice squad, your scout team, is going to be very, very good. And what do you need in the SEC West to be good? A very good football team all the way down the roster. So any place you can improve feels like a place you should. And that's how I read Lane Kiffin's room and why I am settled on Jackson Dart being the guy. All things are open, but that's who I would pick right now, right? And then last on the list for me and the most interesting among these quarterback derbies to watch, it's UCLA. UCLA has perhaps four guys that could start, but three guys that I think actually have a job at it, right? Justin Martin being the fourth guy out. It's a former four-star and outstanding quarterback in himself. But you brought in a transfer in Colin Schley from Kent State. You have Ethan Garbers, who's been in your system for three years and been watching Dorian Thompson Robinson do the job. And you've got the stud, five-star from Detroit out of Martin Luther King High School in Dante Moore. Now, I can understand why you would be tempted to go with the dude that has played starting football the most, right, in Colin Schley. 11 games last year for the Golden Flashes, 2,000 yards passing 13 TDs, five picks, 59% completion. Also, not a terrible runner, 710 rush yards over his career, and coming with a knowledge of an offense that really, really works. Like, and the way I put it, this is Sean Lewis's new offense coordinator, Colorado. Okay, So when he was at Kent State, co-defensive coordinator Todd Bates at Oklahoma went to seek out Sean Lewis because they were going so quick and they were being so prolific in how they got up and, up and down on the ball that they just wanted to talk, right? And it kind of became something like a bidding war for services for Sean Lewis until Deion Sanders was able to secure him for Colorado. So now you have real institutional knowledge from Schley about what that offense looked like, and a guy like Chip Kelly, who has something of an offensive genius himself, might see something he could do with any number of those quarterbacks. But I also think that, Having Schley there is going to be a lot like having Spencer Sanders over at Oklahoma State. You like having that dude? I don't know that you want that dude to start. You want your more talented quarterback to go beat them out. Or in a guy like Ethan Garbers, you want him to show everybody that, no, 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 I'm the guy. I've been here long enough. And it's not just that I've been here long enough. It's that I have used my time here to establish a lead in why I should be the starting quarterback. And your play will, will define that. But I think Dante Moore is the guy that everybody wants to do this because Frankly, if Dante Moore is not the starter in 2024 for UCLA going into the Big Ten, something has gone terribly wrong. It's just what it is, right? I also think that Chip Kelly is the guy that will pick a guy early and stick with him because that's exactly what he did with DTR, right? Dorian Thompson Robinson became the first five-year starter in the history of the sport because of the COVID years, right? And the way that we could look at eligibility and rules. I think the earlier you, you get Dante Moore into the system and make him the guy and get everybody used to rallying around him, the better off you're going to be in the future. Now, does that mean you're going to win a bunch of games this year? Maybe. He's talented enough to pick it up, and I think you go with that. You go with the ceiling, you go with the upside, and you try to build a football team that can take care of Dante in this first year, should it be him. Also, add in here, anybody who plays quarterback at UCLA is going to get to throw the football to Kyle Ford, who transferred over from USC. Kyle Ford's a player, okay? 
Uh, that, that That's just what it is. So I'm excited to see what the Bruins can do. And I also want to make this point because close the loop on this, and I, and I, I sold this to open. Spring football absolutely matters for these quarterbacks because we went into the spring period expecting to see a bunch of derbies go into the summer. Let me tell you about the ones that got settled during the spring. Sam Hartman won the job at Notre Dame. That's why Tyler Buckner entered the transfer portal and why he came out at Alabama. Sam Hartman transferred in from Wake Forest's grad transfer and with the ACC all-time TD record of 110 plus, probably going to stretch that. He looked good in their nasty spring game. <laughs> nasty meaning the weather, not the way the uh, sport was played. But you can understand how that might have gone into the spring if Tyler Buckner showed anybody that he was capable of beating up Sam Hartman, right? At Illinois, Luke Altmyer, who transferred away from Ole Miss to get a shot, has become the dude quick, fast, in a hurry almost as soon as he got there in January. Cade McNamara at Iowa. We already knew that that was probably going to happen, but it's good to see that Kirk Ferentz sees what he needs to out of a guy that's won a Big Ten championship and a guy that's played in the college football playoff. Drew Alar, who is kind of like Dante Moore in a year, right? You got to sit behind Sean Clifford. You got in there for a couple of games or a couple, I should say not games, but plays when Clifford was down with an injury. And everybody got to see the talent that he has. And he's got an outstanding backfield. I think the three best backfields in the sport are all in the Big Ten. Good God. I just said that out loud. Now I'm thinking about it. And I'm so right. Uh, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. Good Lord. And then you're going to have a lot of help. Deontay Cephas is going to help them over the summer. They got Keandre Lambert-Smith. He's going to be in a good spot. But that was a I could have kept going. We got Quinn Ewers at Texas. All of a sudden, all the people that were telling me that Arch Manning could beat out Quinn Ewers were telling me that there was no chance that he was ever going to get out Quinn Ewers. And now that they've seen the spring game, they will all run to fall in line with the Malik Murphy take that I had two years ago. Literally two years ago. Just go check it out on the channel. Been talking about Malik Murphy till I'm blue in the face. Talking about Josh Allen and Malik Murphy till I'm blue in the face. But that's Quinn Ewers' squad now. I'm very excited to see what he could do at Bryant Denny when they go to Alabama later in the summer, or excuse me, summer, in September, which I guess is summer. Tanner Mordecai at Wisconsin, he threw four picks in that game. They still feel good about him being the starter uh, going into this season. Hudson Carter at Purdue, I didn't think you were going to be able to do better at quarterback than Aiden O'Connell was last year and the year before, but I think you got it because Hudson Carter can move around. I'm very excited to see what Graham Harrell gives to the Big Ten, a traditional three yards in a cloud of dust conference that has been airing it out for the last five to ten years. Right? Excited to see how that goes, especially with Ryan Walters as the head coach, because that defense in 2021, excuse me, 2022, was outstanding, right? We saw a bunch of guys drafted off of it. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.